So my name's Laurie Loisel, and I work for the district attorney, uh, Dave Sullivan. I am not a lawyer. Um, I do outreach and education. Um, I have a question. How many of your kids have cell phones? So not, not even anybody. So some of you have held back on the cell phone. Because um, when there's a cell phone involved, that kind of changes because they've got the computer in their pocket, you know. Um, and so um, just a little bit about the DA's office. We don't just prosecute crimes. We do a lot of prevention. So my, that's basically my job is working with communities to really kind of deal with the issues that may, might lead to crime. So we do a lot of substance misuse prevention. And um, increasingly, we've been asked to you know, sort of help schools out with um, cyber issues because that can create problems in communities. So, and um, yeah, so we just work with the communities that in Hampshire and Franklin County. The, this DA's office is just all of Hampshire, all of Franklin, plus the town map. Um, I hope to discuss some strategies with you about how to keep young people safer online. Cyberbullying, cyberbullying, privacy, digital footprint. Um, mainly encouraging you to start conversations early. So those of you that are here with younger kids, that's really good. Um, because it is a little bit harder if your kids have been used to kind of a lot more freedom and then all of a sudden you want to restrict it. It just makes it a much bigger power struggle. Um, and that, um, yeah, and just, just talk with you, through with you, how, how you might find ways to prevent harmful behavior. I don't have a lot to say about gaming but I think some of the things I'll say about other things probably apply to it. Basically, um, you know, the whole idea that your kids might think they're talking to somebody their age, but it could be somebody completely different. I'm sure you know that, but that is something that I think it's hard for young people to kind of grasp, so that's a good thing to really bring home to them. So this is just a little slide that is just indicating where I got the information. And some of this is on a sheet back there of resources. So I encourage you to do your own research as well. Um, we, we also, I'm a journalist by trade. And so when, when we started hearing that this was an issue for a lot of schools and parents, um, we convened a focus group, because I like to find out from people, from the source, like what's going on. So we can be in the focus group of uh, a group of boys, a group of girls, and a group of um, non-binary kids. And to find out, mainly this was about sexting, because we were hearing a lot about sexting. And so I'll have some slides about that. So the first thing is to start early and often. You know, like it's not like the, it's similar to what people, experts say about um, conversations about substance use like the that it's not a ma there's no magic bullet but it's a really good idea to have many conversations not like one big conversation and so um, you know if you're driving to school have a little conversation about you know online safety um, and the issues to really talk about are are the privacy issue and that that um, you know, make sure they know that if they send a nude picture to some to somebody close to them, it could be shared. It's easy to share. Um, I feel like I'm telling you things you all know, but um, in that that there's a lot of false information online, and that people might be pretending to be someone they're not. Um, also, the whole thing about texting and driving, and just make sure this. I know this is this is a, this is a tangent from this topic, but I just feel like it's really important for all of us to remind ourselves because it's so easy to to get caught up in like I have to communicate at this moment, you know. So just if you're telling your kids not to text, it's important that you're not texting while you're driving. And and that if at all possible to just listen to them and don't like react in a strong way because that's just gonna shut them up. And the really the the key for this is just to have an open um, relationship where you're your, your young people feel like they can talk to you and that they're not going to get in trouble. That's really important, especially if they've done something that gets them um, into a position where they're maybe vulnerable or in trouble. It's just important that they have an adult to come to. 
whether it's cyberbullying or sexting. <coughs> um, so the other thing is that it really varies what you want to say to kids depending on their age, of course. Um, and so young, young children, you know, it's developmentally appropriate to restrict apps and that they have close supervision. And that will also help you as they get older because that will be the expectation. Um, but when they're in their tweens, you know, they're going to want they're going to want some more independence, but they also still need guidance. And so, um, so I, I feel like sometimes parents want to know the exact right thing to do to say, you know, to make sure their kids don't get in trouble. And I don't think it's quite that simple. So all I can do is suggest to you what some of the experts say. And so setting limits. But every family is different, so um, it's just something that you all have to see what is is your family culture, your family value, but some some families are saying, you know, we're gonna have like dinner time where all the phones get put away. It's just it's just something you need to think through because it's it's not just the predators that are worrisome, it's also how much time kids are spending. There, there's just lots of lots of issues that are getting in the way of kids learning and functioning as adults. Full disclosure, my kids are 25 and 27, so I feel like they came of age like just beyond. So I don't have the same trouble that you all might have, which is that you know there's these phones. Like when my kids, when we first got cell phones, it was flip phones, and so it's just not the. So they didn't really get cell phones until they were in college. So I feel like that it's. I I just have a lot of sympathy for parents who have kids either in junior high or, or high school, middle school or high school, where they have where they have computers for, for in their pockets because it's such a big thing for somebody so young to have and know how to navigate time-wise. So I think parents need to get in there and help them. Um, and again, you know, your teenagers are definitely gonna be having more, um, more, Freedom, and that's the way it should be. But it's real. That's why it's more important to have, a, you know, have set the stage for conversations where they feel like they can come to you and they're not going to get in trouble no matter what they tell you. Um, I, else I, can tell you. I guess the other thing is sometimes people want to know like what app they can use to restrict the kids, and you know there are some. And one of the one of the handouts I have has some suggestions about that. But I do think that. Whatever that, that technology changes very quickly, and, and young people will know how to get around it. So I think you can't really rest on that to know that that's the thing that's going to keep them safe for that reason. Um, so the message is you want to make sure they understand, and these little conversations that you're going to have is you know that people online might not be who they seem to be and that any images that they share might be shared by others, um, and that once something is posted, um, it's hard to get it removed. I mean, I can't say it would never be removed, but it's very hard. And uh, the whole digital footprint thing, and um, that increasingly employers and colleges are looking at social media for people that are applying, and that can come back to haunt people. That might be what person who said, somebody back there said something about um, college students that are regretting, is that you? But um, the other thing is that the whole idea of snarky messages, that there's this false sense of anonymity um, and that, that, you know, that combined with the um, young person's like maybe less Im impulse control so they might post something that if they really thought it through, they wouldn't, and that that can be so hurtful. So I think that is a really good conversation to have, and that is the kind of thing that's happening where schools are really concerned about cyberbullying. And um, so I think it's important to talk to kids about like what it's like, what it feels like to get that kind of thing, and that you know, and it really is um, the the line between the bullier and the bullied is really it goes back and forth. And so, you know, that's, that's another thing, is um, just really try to get them to think about how it would feel if they, somebody did that to them. Okay. So this slide is, um, uh, came from this 
one of the websites which I really like, and it's really talking about, they do this, I think they might do this every year, surveys of teenagers, and they're asking them questions about um, their use of social media, and I think what's interesting to me is you can see how the, how the use time goes up, like, um, so the percentage of teens with a smartphone in 2012 was 41%, now it's 89%, or in 2018, who knows what it is now, but, um, and then the percentage of teens who use social media multiple times a day, 34% up to 70%. It's just tremendous, it's just, it just happened so fast. And, um, and no wonder parents are confused um, because it's not what you were doing when you were their age. Um, so, but the, there was one of these slides, which, am I, okay. Um, what is this website? It is co uh, Common Sense Media, I think. Uh, I'll have to go back to the beginning, but I think it's Common Sense Media. I have it on that handout that I sent, that I put out there. Um, but what I think is interesting about this is how, how kids themselves are talking about feeling like they are spending too much time on it, but they don't have to talk. So that's, so I guess what I'm saying is that it's worth it for you parents to like fight the good fight and, and you know, um, try to get them to go outside or whatever it is that you want them to do that isn't online and limit the time um, if you can. I think some of these kids are saying they now regret it. And as, so. um, yeah, I mean, it's very, it's kind of heartbreaking to see that some of them are, are feeling like their social media, their, their smartphone is taking time away from the people they are supposedly spending time with. So, um, so sexting is, um, everybody know what sexting is? Yeah. So, um, it is true that when um, a juvenile sends a naked picture, it is technically considered child pornography. That is true. Mostly when, um, and I'm not a lawyer, but so I'm not. Uh, but I do know that most district attorneys don't want to prosecute like consensual sexting. However. Um, if it got to a point where uh, an explicit, sexually explicit image was then forwarded on or used as part of a cyberbullying thing or this thing called sextortion, that's when prosecution would get, would get involved. Um, but for the most part, if we get cases in our office, the, the assistant district attorneys try to work with the kids and um, do some education around it. Um, but it, it's important to, I guess, what I found out when we did these um, focus groups is just how common it is, and that it is um, part of how you know, the young people these days relate to each other. It's just, um, I was just very surprised to find out how common it is. Are you aware of that? Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's a big problem, and, and kids do think it's, well, some think it's normal, and some are completely shocked and, and flooded by it. Have, you know, to address it multiple times in different fashions, yeah, and um, explain all of these things, but it's rampant, um, and it's very disturbing. It's like it's like a it's like a part of courting, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's just something that might be an uncomfortable conversation, but really worth having because if even if your child isn't doing it, they might be receiving it. So it's just important to talk about. Um, there are some district attorneys that are trying to sort of get the law changed so that when the, when it is a situation of consensual, you know, people and kids in a relationship texting each other, that that is something that is treated differently. Like, um, but right now, according to the law, it's it's child pornography, even if you send a picture of yourself. So does that make sense, everybody? So this is, um, so when we had these focus groups, I just thought, I thought it might be helpful for people to hear what they said about why they do it. And so they just say they're curious. Sometimes it's peer pressure. Sometimes it's to show that you trust somebody. Um, I mean, these are direct quotes from local kids, high school kids. Um, you know, validation. Um, it's 
just part of what they do. Um, we did ask them what the downsides are, and that so, and when we did that, it just sort of became clear that, that even though it does seem like it, what they feel like it's a normal part of ritual of teen dating kind of thing, that there is some ambivalence on their part, and that sometimes they feel pressured to do it. Um, one girl, one girl said she would just feel mortified if her father saw it, or and they, others said if their parents saw it, they would just hate that, or a large group of people seeing it, so, and they're aware, you know, you never really know who's trustworthy, but again, I mean, we're, we're all humans, so, you know, if you think you have a relationship with someone, and you can trust them. You can trust them until you can. Yeah. So, it's hard, it's a hard one to wrap your brain around, even if you're an adult. So, so they said, you know, you, they would think it's important to talk about how permanent it can be, they said abstinence only education doesn't work. They felt like, when we did this focus group, um, they said they had never had an opportunity to talk about these issues with other students. And we pulled students from different schools. We thought it would be better if they didn't actually didn't know each other, like have the anonymity. And so that actually did work really well. And I was really struck by how they could not stop talking. And um, they had never had anybody ask them about these issues. So um, anyway, I thought that was diagnostic kind of. Um, and this is, again, somebody said this, you, well, I guess you were saying this, you're telling them the right thing, you know, stop before you, stop before you send, you know, think before you do these things online. And again, talk openly about oh, romantic relationships and sexting. And talk about things they can do to protect their privacy and the permanency of things on the internet. Uh, this is just a, a look at some of the apps that, that uh, young people are using them. You're all familiar with these, um, I'm assuming, yeah. So, um, but again, these change um, kind of rapidly, what they use changes. Um, so cyberbullying is, uh, again, what's happening a lot and um, it's ch it changes the nature of bullying and it has a, a different impact than kind of the traditional schoolyard bullying. Um, it can make kids feel like they, oddly, that they can't get away from it. Because when, before this kind of internet presence, ever present, um, they, you know, maybe they would feel, I'm not saying it was good or healthy, but they might feel picked on at school, but then they could go home. But with, with people online, it's just not as simple as saying, if you don't go online, don't go on Facebook, they feel like they can't get away from it, so that they're, it follows them home and it's taking a toll on their mental health. Um, the differences between cyber and traditional bullying are what we talked about already, but the anonymity and how it can be done. Bullying can happen if, while being anonymous and that it can happen anytime. It's hard for the victims to avoid and there's a bigger audience and the whole lack of remorse because you don't see the impact of the hurt that you're causing. And that there's also this odd fear of reporting um, because then that person that you're getting in trouble might lose their computer and like that's the worst thing in the world that could happen. Um, it's more common than schoolyard bullying but it's also more harmful. Um, so I thought this was interesting. I went to a conference in Washington and they had a little presentation and so I picked up some of these from that. But the signs of someone who's experiencing cyberbullying and the next slide is the signs of someone who might be cyberbullying. So, and they're kind of similar. <laughs> um, so someone who's experienced cy cyberbullying might stop using their devices, appear nervous when they're using devices. They might be angry, depressed, or frustrated after being online avoid discussions about what they're doing, they become unusually secretive, um, and then they want to spend more time with their parents rather than their peers. So, um, and then uh, some of these, in this slide, is similar things. They, they, they hide in their device, they're switching screens, but there's a few other things that are kind of signs, like they laugh while they're using their device. Um, they might have a seeming insensitivity about their peers and they feel they have a lot of um, power around their tech skills and abilities. So, just kind of more 
listening signs, I guess. Um, and then what we can all do is just to pay attention, establish rules, understand the school rules, um, be digitally aware yourself. Um, and if you see any cyberbullying, save evidence of it. Um, and, but the other thing is that unless it's really bullying, it's advice <coughs> that parents don't get involved in, in, in uh, a spat online between kids. They're big snarky with each other. That you, uh, it's happened at some other schools we've been called about, um, you know, parents really getting into it. And that doesn't help. Maybe, I don't know if you want to say anything about that. But that I guess it depends on the situation. Sometimes we've been called help address the situation that it's gotten above and beyond yeah. just the back and forth. Yeah. Or we might hear about it and listen. But, um, but I guess what I think is, what I'm trying to say is to talk to your, your child about what they're doing rather than getting in there and trying to solve the problem for them. Because right. This to like encourage them to block certain people yeah. or unfollow certain people um, to avoid future yeah. negative interactions. Did you have anything you want to say about that? No. No. Um, so this is something that, uh, this really good book called Untangled, Guiding Girls Through Seven Transitions in Pindalgo by Lisa Damore. Because um, girls are impacted differently than boys. Um, it seems like that's what they're saying. Anyway, I really like this idea about, you know, um, we can't really throw the baby out. We don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. I mean, the, this access to the internet really does give some kids uh, a sense of community that they didn't have before. So there are some really good things about it. So it's just, it's all about balance. Um, and then uh, I also just really like this, that, you know, what we're, Healthy relationships depend upon complex and subtle social skills that are best learned in the context of real, not virtual, interactions. Um, and so she encouraged this other encourages parents to ban technology from places where you want to have interaction. And when I ask somebody, is, is the horse out of the barn, I'm, that what I was referring to is sometimes we're already kind of like beyond that, like we're eating dinner and everybody's on their phone and it's too late to change, but I think it's worth trying if you are in that situation. And then just in terms of what, what young people can do to keep themselves safe is to know their friends, don't accept friend requests from people they don't know, and to think about their digital footprint and that this could be forever or for a very long time and that you might not have privacy and really, really impress upon them that if they are feeling cyberbullied, they really need, they need help. They shouldn't be dealing with that alone. Um, and I think sometimes that, um, that we are concerned about like the predator or the worry about predators, people we don't know that are gonna do something awful. And there is that, but I also think there's just the confusion of what social media does to kids when they're young. And the whole thing about like, every time you have a feeling, you go online. And the, you know, I'm sure you've heard about how the issues that kids have when they don't get enough likes, or you know, that, the, that kind of thing is just like, they're being confronted with something that they might not have the developmental ability to deal with, you know. So that's another kind of reason to sort of think about maybe limiting some of the time that they have because they need help. Uh, this is kind of an old slide, but basically just wanted to say that, you know, um, if you, you know, if you, this is also kind of, if you see something, just alert somebody at a school, you know, they're, we had some situations at the park where there were some troubling incidents and people told somebody at the school that they called the DA's office and we were able to kind of look into it. So it's just a real, we encourage, if you see something that's concerning to you, 
don't minimize your um, concern. You know, get get in touch. Yeah, with we see that kids will come and say mm -hmm. that they've seen something, and a lot of parents will call if they're concerned that they saw something on their child's social media or texting. That's helpful. Yeah, and and our office won't overreact. We'll just kind of look into it and mm -hmm. try to they try to deal with it in a really humane way. Yeah. And I don't mean just. I don't want to scare you not gun violence. I mean, like, if there's a kid who's not feeling well and they're worried about a kid or somebody posts something, you know, that's concerning, they'll let us know mm -hmm. so that we can check it out. So it's helpful. Um, oh, yes, yeah, so this is more. The, it's just really important for, for parents to pay attention to their kids' social media posts. And so if you, you know, some parents make contracts with their kids and you have, to, you have to know their passwords again. If your if your kids are older and it's too late, it might you might not. It might be hard for you to do. But if your kids are younger, you might want to start with, yeah, you can have a phone, but I need to have access to your passwords and I need to check your social media accounts. That's the habit. Then they don't feel like you're invading their privacy. Later. I started. But yeah, you can have this thing that you want, this computer in your pocket, but I need something from you too because I need to help you stay safe. Um, yeah. I forgot to ask, is, is it possible to show a video up here? Yeah, okay. Um, this, is a, this is a free phone app that you can get and it's about, it, and it, it is, um, I used to have it on my phone but I, but I took it off. Um, but it's from SAMHSA, the Substance Abuse Mental Health Services Administration. Um, and it has little prompts of conversation starters so that you can have with your kids. So it's just kind of helpful to, it's not always easy to know how to have those conversations. So there are some tips to help you have those conversations. Um, this is another book that I, Enough As She Is by Rachel Simmons, who also wrote Queen Bees and Wannabes. Um, and she really focuses a lot on young women and how it's different for them. And again, it's this idea that young women are using social media to sort of create an image about their lives that are hard to live up to. And again, I kind of go back to um, what it's like for adults. I, I, I know a lot of adults, myself included, I, if I want to make myself feel bad, I go on Facebook <laughs> uh, <yeah. laughs> and look at how happy everybody else is. You know what I mean? Like, it's just like, why do I do this? So if I do that and I'm like almost 60, what, what happens to younger people? You know, it's just, it can be very compelling and you are comparing your own insides to what you see somebody posting. It's just, it, it can be really hard for, for young people. And so there needs to be not just a conversation about like you know your friends and understand that this might be this might not be a young person that you're gaming with it might be an adult it might be but also that they need to another thing parents need to do is work with their kids about how to regulate regulate their emotions and their time online and then um, this is. This is another idea to talk about with your kids about like cyberbullying, about how if you see, because there are, there are kids that are feeling bullied, kids that are maybe targeting other kids, but then there are all the people around them. So really to talk to your young people about how if they see something like that, they, they don't have to do nothing. They can post, they can say, I disagree with that, like, you know, um, Oh, this reminds me too. The other thing that um, back this is back to the um, the focus groups when we were talking to the young people about sexting. The other thing they said was to remind people, remind your young people that they can say no. You know that there's some power to saying no just because somebody's asking you to do something <coughs> and it feels very compelling and you really have a crush on that person. You actually have a right to say no. So sort of like build that that muscle up in them. And I see this as similar, where you're just um, trying to really encourage them to to be uh, not not be a conformist and not go along with the crowd. 
Did you have a question or comment? Yeah, um, you keep mentioning books. There's another book uh, that examines the difference on social media and cyberbullying and this kind of thing on girls in particular called American Girls by Nancy Jo Sales. Okay. It is outstanding. Oh. She spent like a year and a half with about 10 packs of teenage girls across the country. And they just allowed her to hang out with them. And they would heal all about what they were doing in their interactions with other yeah. kids and in particular boys. And it really, um, for anyone who's in on social media every day, um, it, it would, it would, it, it leaves you slack job a little bit. Yeah. At the age of what some of these kids, in particular, again, I just want to say girls are dealing with. Yeah. And the pressure that's on them, the chasing of likes and, yeah. and um, you know, <coughs> statistics are pretty alarming for girls. Yeah. When the use of, um, when this activity goes way up, so does anxiety, depression, you know, grades drop. Yeah. There's yeah. self-harm that comes in. And like you said, it's not, those might be the worst, that might be the worst case scenario, but honestly, why take a chance? You know, so. The tricky thing is, is that, I mean, it would be easy to say, like, okay, you can't have a computer, you can't have a phone, but it's just, it's not that simple. And so, it, there's a lot of gray in this, because as I said, you know, some some young people are, feel like, especially like, we had, a, we had that non-binary GLBTQ um, focus group, and they were talking about how they find community online. So there is a way that, you know, online can, you know, you can find validation in a good way. So it's not all bad. So as parents, we can't, we can't, um, yeah. we can't just like say no. Better to teach them how to develop those skills. Because they're going to live and they're going to have to figure it out later on. Anyway. Yeah. So it's, so can I, can I click on this, um, how does this? It should be. What? I don't. Oh, I probably have to get out the internet. That link doesn't look right. I think I probably didn't do that. Oh, she's, she's not logged in. Period. Okay. Period. 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 You could probably find it's on YouTube. So if I log in, can she do it that way? Yeah. Can I do that? To the internet. You get a try? Okay. I think you can save that period on YouTube. Yeah. No, it. No, it's a. Tell it. I don't know if they're going to try. Yeah. Um. But anyway, I anyway I liked it, so I wanted to show it to you. And, and there are some other really short videos you can find on YouTube too that really show the impact of um, snarky online behavior. And so that could be also something that you do in prompt a conversation with your students. So, <coughs> Mr. Murphy, is that it? Yes. Yeah. Um, I'm wondering, do you? Do you teach digital literacy? Yeah, um, yes, I do, uh, middle school and high school. I have a class called Social Media. Oh. And it's really an exploration, and really a chance to just chat with these kids about what they do and what they like, and, and we go over you know, safety and um, you know, cyber, some bullying stuff. But yeah, yeah, we really kind of dig in. But we also look at the marketing side of it, you know, the benefits for markets and, yeah. and getting the word out, those kinds of things. Do you find yourself surprised by some of the things they're telling you, or? Well, you know, I'm really surprised was uh, how savvy Thanks, they are guys. about fake news. They are more savvy than we would think about fake news, and that was a really comforting. Yeah. I was thinking uh, that's one of our topics of, of choice, and uh, mm. it's just you know you worry about the fake news that we're seeing now, but kids are way more savvy. Yeah. Things, so that's that's really nice. <laughs> um, yeah, there is some addiction. Addiction is huge. Um, that's, that's something that the kids admit to, um, and that they're scrappling with, and they're trying to find ways. I have kids with their heads down on the desk at two because they're up at two in the morning playing games, mm -hmm. and they know it, and mm -hmm. they admit it, you know. And I and I have chats with them about it. 
um, because it's addicting and they know it. And they, yeah. they, they try, to, the next day they'll come in and say, oh, I only stay up to midnight. Oh, you know, I try to get them to go to bed a little bit earlier each night, you know, just because, mm -hmm. you know, and of course they're not doing their homework, they're not doing those things, mm -hmm. but. Yeah. It, 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 it's an awareness thing, it's, it's, a, it's a trying to handle it, you know, situation. Yeah. YouTube is another big thing that kids are up all night watching. I don't know if you're aware of <laughs> they're, they're addicted to oh, yeah, YouTube. YouTube after YouTube right. after YouTube. And, and, and the raunchy content that they're getting all the time, it's, 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 it's a culture, it's a culture. Yeah. Have you ever watched, uh, what's that show on MTV, what's it called, uh, uh, Ridiculousness? Uh, yeah. It's on, it, they have like marathons all the time on MTV. And it's just internet trash. Yeah. All day, mm -hmm. but that's the culture that they have. That's that's what they care about. Yeah. And it's just hard, you know. You kind of try to try to figure it out. Yeah, it's kind of sad to think that then that's time that they'll never get back, and to think that there's some regret later on. Does everyone is everyone required to take that class? No, no. it's not. So I wonder, do people think it should be required? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I think the wellness class covers a, a bit of, you know, internet and usage and moderation mm -hmm. and cautions. I think wellness tries to cover a lot. It's, it's a, there's a lot of topics, but I'm pretty sure they touch on it. And cell phone use and consent. So, we're here tonight as parents, you know, educators, to learn listening to you. So. Is this is a similar presentation like this presented to the kids? Because I hear a lot, I know I've had one kid who's gone through the whole school system and is now in college and I have one that's almost finished here. And a lot of what I have heard that they get at school is more along the scare tactic side. And that doesn't work. It doesn't work at all. Yeah. They I need stuff more like what we're getting tonight, the informational side, instead of if you do this, this is going to happen. So what happens at the, at the school level? Do they get an assembly like this that's more relaxed, that's not threatening, that's not... Currently, in the middle school right now, currently we have high school students that were trained in the social justice issues that are going into the middle schools to make smaller groups like you're talking about to discuss different issues and I believe sexting and some of these other uncomfortable situations are coming up. Who's to going to the start dialogue and it's overseen by guidance and um, our vice principal is, is involved so in it. So you say smaller and groups, our well as teacher. But does it cover do all the kids in middle school get to be part I think of that? Right now currently it's eighth grade I believe. We're just starting it this year so I think it's smaller but the intent is for it to grow. Okay. And now so who's teaching this stuff to the high schoolers that are... So it's a combination of gui our guidance department, um, our wellness teachers, and our vice principals. Right, stuff. but you're talking that you're, they're going to just small groups, but you also have 9, 10, 11, and 12th graders that's a couple hundred kids right there that are already immersed in the, all of this. Right. How is that being addressed? Well, like, like I said earlier, I think the wellness classes are addressing some, a lot of these issues. I mean, it's, it's a lot to cover because there's also suicidality and vaping and, you know, hygiene and all that to cover. But I do believe there's a part of the curriculum that covers pieces of this. Yeah, I mean, very small pieces. Yeah, I, think there yeah, I mean, it's a good to think about putting together something similar or, you know, I mean, yeah. and making an assembly of it. Right. You know, I mean, they do assemblies for, I mean, obviously I'm not trying to say that you know vaping and stuff like that is not important of course it is right but this you know this is the generation that our kids are living in mm -hmm. and like mr murphy said you know the knowledge that the kids have you know i think all of us parents right. hear that if we have any kid that's older or anybody here we all know we've gone to ask our kids hey how do i do this right how do, how do i you know and even as educators in the classroom you know, okay, who did you just ask to do that? You asked one of the kids, <laughs> you know? Right. How, do I, right. how do I watch this video? So they know a lot more than I think we even give them credit for. Oh, absolutely, yeah. You know, it's they're very up. aware of all this stuff. And these things are developing by the minute. <laughs> exactly, right. I mean, when my daughter was in high school, you know, when you talk about not being able to get away from it, you know, stuff starts happening in school, but it right. carries <coughs> home. And right. 
and I watched her withdraw, and I watched her turn into a depression, and come to find out it's because she was being threatened by her boyfriend, and her way of re getting through that was to be suicidal. You know, and she thought the only way that she could get out of this horrible situation was to hurt herself because it just continued after she left school. And she couldn't, it's that addiction of not being able to put the phone down, even though in her head she knew she should put it down and walk away, you know, or block his number or whatever, you, you can't. It's, it's that strong power. And, Absolutely. you know, I ended up having to take her to crisis one night. And so it doesn't stop. I mean, and even with all the education, it's still with vaping and drugs and everything. I mean, all we can do is, you know, as parents, you know, the same old adage that's been around for years is it takes a village. Right. Well, you know, I think an, um, one important conversation to have is like how, even if like this would be hard, but to brainstorm with your kids about how they would say no if they were mm -hmm. asked to do something they didn't want to do. Exactly. So. I saw a video of, actually it was in a classroom, a teacher was doing, they had these little pads and she, um, they were talking about sexting and she said, so let's talk about if you, somebody asked you to send a picture and you didn't want to send it, what would you say? And so they, all the, all the it was, I think it was a middle school class, mm -hmm. it seemed, and um, I should send that, that link to you because it was really, I thought it was very moving the way the teacher got the kids themselves to think about what they might do right. in that situation. Like one of them said, um, I would say, my mother just came in the room. And you know, um, <laughs> they, so they had some creative ideas about how they'd say no. And it might, I think it's good to have the conversation before there's a crisis. Right. So then it's in the back of their brain. Even if they say, I would never do that. Nobody's ever gonna ask me. You just don't know. Right. And so if you've had the conversation when it isn't like a hot button moment, then when, if they are in that situation, they'll have maybe some tools that will come to them. Um, so can I show this? Yeah. Okay. yeah. So it's only two minutes. Yeah. 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 It'll just, the audio won't come out of the speakers. It'll just come out of your computer. Oh, so um, Oh, so we won't be able to hear it? Maybe? Well, then that. I think you can hear it. Put the microphone. Uh, Sources, but I've made copies back there. There's other articles back there. Um, so, anybody want to comment? Or, well, I'm aware that it's a school night, so everybody, if anybody doesn't have anything else to say or ask, I think we can stop. Thanks for coming out.